Hello and welcome to the Fit and Free podcast. This is a podcast for women who want it all, to feel strong and confident in their bodies, as well as enjoying a sneaky mug on a Friday night. I'm an exercise physiologist and sports nutritionist here to teach you how to achieve your body goals without food and your body controlling your life. So let's jump in. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Fit and Free podcast. Today, we have a special guest, Beck, who is actually one of my clients. She's here to tell her story, how she was able to gain food freedom and really focus on healing her relationship with food, her body, working on her physical self, as well as her emotional self. So, Beck, so happy to have you here. I would love you if you could introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you and what does life currently look like for you? Hi, Laura. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, But before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that I come to you from Darug country here in Western Sydney. I pay my utmost respect to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the resilience and strength of the oldest continuing culture on earth. Looking after the lands, waterways and skies has been a massive job and I say thank you for that. And for all the atrocities committed past and present, I say sorry. I would also like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. So we record today on what always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you so much for that. (laughs) So um, I guess my life has changed a lot in the last couple of months. So until very recently, I was a full-time high school teacher, but then I realized I was so burnt out from the work hours and the expectations and even the emotional baggage that comes with, you know, being that support person for so many students. So I took a break and resigned and now my career is completely up in the air. So my life is a lot more about all of the other things that should make up your life. So I have my two gorgeous dogs who are enjoying the extra cuddle time. Mm -hmm. I go to the gym a lot more with my husband and spend more quality time with him apart from just grunting at each other in the morning. Mm -hmm. Um, On the weekends, I get to go for runs with my brother and sister. And then I just casual teach here and there to keep some income flowing. So my life is a lot more balanced. Um, It's less about my job and more about all of those other things. Um, So my identity was so wrapped up in being a teacher. And right now, I really don't know who I am outside of that. And job hunting has proved very humbling. So that's kind of where I'm at. Wow. How freaking inspiring is that? Because like, I know so many people who are literally like just in the grind, like doing it, you know, day after day, like hating their lives and not actually being able to make change. So for you to able to actually take action, take responsibility and like, you know, completely transform your life, it's just a testament to your own strength and your own, you know, you as a person, because like that takes a lot of courage and that takes a lot of bravery. So just in that self, like that is so inspiring. So I remember you going through that process and it was so inspiring for you to watch because it's terrifying, like quitting a job. And especially like in this culture of like, we're supposed to do things a certain way, right? We're supposed to, you know, go to university, get a job, get a house, you know, we're being conditioned to this lifestyle. And then for you to like, you know, break the rules is phenomenal. So like just in that self is like amazing. Thank you. So in terms of moving towards more like our relationship with food and your body, where did you first really become aware of this? I don't think I really kind of drew that connection between my food intake and what my body was doing until midway through my teens because my parents largely controlled my food before that. So I didn't really think about it too much. I just kind of ate what I was given and all those like normal stereotypes that all of us had, like you can't have dessert until you've eaten all your food. And, you know, we had the veggies on the plate and all of that stuff. It was like quite normal. I will say that, you know, for my parents, I was quite straightforward because I didn't refuse my veg. I wasn't like one of those kids. So it was just food was food. But then uh, in year eight, I um, started having access to our school canteen because I was the only child left at school and my dad could not be bothered to make lunch just for one child anymore. So he'd just hand me, you know, $10 every morning. So I was doubling up on breakfast. So I'd have one at home and then I'd go and buy like a burger from the canteen. And then I was having two minute noodles as like a snack. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> not not great. Um, and I wasn't very active. I didn't play any sports. I didn't do any of that. So 
that was also kind of in that time where girls are getting bitchier. You know, we say in education that for high school, year seven and year nine are the worst years because in year seven, you're new and you fight for that, you know, clicky top spot. And then in year nine, there's that opportunity to kind of take on those clicks again. And so everything gets reshuffled. So it was around that time that Everyone's starting to like start to get a bit more bitchy. The boys were starting to be a bit more rude. Social media was getting started. So when I was in year eight, nine, like I had a Snapchat, had an Instagram and I had a Facebook. So we had online drama starting, offline drama all the time. My friends were quite bitchy. I was very bitchy. And then I was getting really curvy, more curvy than I was used to. And I kind of looked around at all my friends. So I was like, oh, you don't look like me. But then kind of in year nine, one of my friends who was curvy like I was, she dropped a whole heap of weight really quickly. And so I was like, you know, what did you do? How did you achieve this? Mm -hmm. And she just said, oh, I only eat dinner. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. So I did that. So like maybe six or eight months, I wouldn't have breakfast. You know, the money that my dad gave me for the canteen, I was buying like definitely water. Um, And I know that I was probably buying a dare iced coffee, which is not great. But um, by this point, I already had a coffee addiction because of the family that I grew up in. Um, And then I was just eating dinner. So obviously my calories were so low for a growing teenage girl that I dropped almost all of that extra weight that I'd been carrying. I wasn't skinny. So I never looked like my friends did even after that weight loss because genetically I have a very big bum. And so I've always just been very curvy, but I did have my little waist back, you know, at the end of this period was actually when I first started dating my boyfriend, who is now my husband. Mm -hmm. And so intellectually, um, I understand there's no relationship, but emotionally I was like, I got skinny and then I got, I became attractive and I got the boyfriend and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, that was kind of the beginning of me realizing that what I ate actually had some sort of relationship with the body that I was end up in, even though it kind of wasn't concrete in my mind yet. I also had a cyst that was growing in my stomach, which they found a year later when I went to the doctor and said, you know, I can't finish a happy meal, Mm -hmm. which for me was like, Mm. quite a big deal you know if I can only eat three chicken nuggets at a time that's you know that's odd (laughs) so um you know they did some investigations it started the size of a golf ball and by the time they took it out it was the size of a grapefruit so when they drained it it was a liter of liquid so I lost a kilo literally in an hour but also because it had been kind of squishing my stomach to the side and I couldn't eat that much I'd already dropped a whole heap of weight I was working so I was you know walking around a lot um, on the weekends and all of that stuff so you know actually I was quite unhealthy if you look back at the photos I was pale and really like Mm -hmm. my cheekbones were really really prominent but then once they removed that cyst and my eating habits returned to normal because I didn't realize that what I looked like before was unhealthy when I started getting my curves back and I started filling out again I actually got really stressed out by that reality was that you know I was a young woman now you know by this point I was like 17 and Mm -hmm. you know I was not a child anymore so I had the curves I started to look like a woman but yeah so this was kind of where I realized that that if I didn't want to have the extra weight have the extra curves I just dramatically reduce my meals down yeah Wow. Thank you for sharing that with us. Like that is such a story. And that is so crazy that you had that pushing against your stomach. Like that is absolutely wild. There are so many pieces that I would love to speak to in this in terms of like the first one, like these are the years that we really have to bring awareness to that are really shaping our belief systems up until we get older. Right. And it's really nice to bring back and reflect on these stories to understand where these stories that we have created come from. So like you've just said, like this eating less, story equals weight loss and that's something that we've created at like this such young age so of course then as we get older we've already got that belief system so then what do we do when we want to lose weight we always just think we have to go low calories we have to cut everything out x y and z but that's not actually the way to lose weight which we'll yeah <laughs> like last year I was trying to get you know fit for my wedding and mm. so I was like eating a thousand calories a day and just yeah. basically eating broccoli and it- <laughs> It's like, why am I so hungry? Yeah, why? <laughs> why can't I stop binge eating? Why do I yeah. have to Surprise. Um, <laughs> but this is a perfect opportunity. Like in the school system, how much education is there in and around nutrition? Because that is such an important thing. And I literally had this conversation with my mum like three days ago in terms of, because I was the same. I was eating two-minute noodles. Like my nutrition growing up wasn't like 
very good. And like, I don't blame my parents for it whatsoever, but it's just the lack of education. So that's why like learning about this stuff, because once we know it's like anything, right, it's something Mm -hmm. that we'll know forever. Within that education system and you being a teacher, how much is their education in and around nutrition and in around social media? Um, So I guess I'm not a huge expert on this because it's mostly relegated to the PDHP department, especially in New South Wales. Um, So, you know, from my understanding, you know, they do the food pyramid. They learn about, you know, healthy eating habits and, you know, structuring, you know, especially in the seniors, they do actually learn about, you know, structuring really good workout programs and rehab programs and things like that. But that's that's yeah. obviously an elective yeah. in the senior school. So in the juniors, they do, you know, they learn about, you know, what sort of foods are healthy and what sort of healthy foods are not. But there is that emphasis on, you know, that balanced plate. So we aren't necessarily saying good and bad. As far as I've seen it done, it is just, you know, these are the varieties. But I would also say that from my experience, you know, the best teachers for this type of thing would be all teachers. So, yeah. um, you know, our curriculum is so packed, you know, we, we struggle to get through everything. So, mm-hmm. you know, when we're looking Looking at things that we cut, we cut out things like that because that's not going to help our kids with their nap plan. It's not going to help our kids with the HSC. Yeah. And that's what we're all measured on. But, you know, if all kids saw that their teachers had these very real, you know, life understandings, because just because someone's, you know, a maths teacher doesn't mean they don't understand about nutrition. So mm-hmm. I think maybe moving to a more holistic, maybe well-being centered approach for that kind of curriculum. Um, and that would play the same, you know, for social media, we do it all, you know, you don't believe what you see on social media. It's it's all about comparing, you know, being safe online. But I think for some of these things as well, unless a child has experienced it, it hasn't touched them yet. Yeah. And some of the concepts in my area, we teach about credit cards and you're teaching credit cards to a 14 year old and they don't have the understanding of what's going on. So sometimes it's like we're trying to give them information for their future self, but because it's so far away from what to know now, you mm-hmm. know, it would be more suited for a, you know, a 20 year old to have that learning. And I think the same with nutrition and things like that you know, kids don't really you know, care, maybe don't really need to know until they need to know. And then they don't know. Yeah. I absolutely love that. And that's crazy how it's, it's so like results driven, right. And it's not mm-hmm. necessarily, which is a little bit sad, but like, that's how the world works. <laughs> so, yeah. At the moment. I, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but then we can pull the part of like, not necessarily then teaching at schools, but just the importance of our of parents really learning about nutrition. And I think that's where like we, especially as like, you know, in our twenties, really needing to learn about this stuff. So therefore eventually like when we are the parents that we can really transform our kid's life and really making sure that they they are eating well and eating right. So Yeah, exactly. Because I feel like a lot of the messages that we've spoken about that we got around food, we got them sitting at the table at home. We didn't mm-hmm. get them at school. And yep. so it is a lot more important that the correct information is coming out in that home environment, in that yep. safe space. Um, and building that, you know, trust relationship with kids from yeah. their parents. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I love that so much. Coming back to you and your story, I would love if you could dive deep into like when you really first struggling with food and your body. So I was reflecting on, you know, kind of this, and I've always thought about myself as being a little bit, you know, bigger than my friends, but the memory that stuck out the most, and actually I've been thinking about it a lot lately, so maybe the universe was preparing me for this (laughs) podcast, was that I went to the beach with my friend and her family, um, all her cousins and everything, when I was maybe eight or nine, Mm. and I was sucking my tummy in as I was walking up and down to the water, and I insisted that I needed to have board shorts on because my thighs were fatter than everyone else's and so that was kind of the beginning for me really from a very young age where I was comparing what I look like to what my friends look like my body wasn't you know as athletic as theirs which made a lot a lot of sense I wasn't playing sports I wasn't athletic as a child I would rather be reading a book so I was very conscious that you know when we were playing games and stuff even in primary school in the playground that I'd be the one that was out of breath first that I was the one that couldn't throw or catch or kick that well you know I was just not very good at those things so I absorbed that as me being fatter So it wasn't because I didn't play netball on the weekends that I wasn't very good at it. It was because I was fatter, which was obviously the reason. And then I went through puberty very early compared to my friends as well. So late primary school when most of them were, you know, in early high school. So I developed, you know, the curve. So my boobs came in and my butt got bigger and all of those things. 
from a younger age and that really played havoc on my self-esteem because I'm looking at my friends who were so skinny they had it all they could do it all and then there was just like me the dumpy friend in the corner that couldn't do things so I was just convinced I was you know the fat friend even though you know we accept in 2022 that being fat is not bad and you know I was just comparing myself to them and they had different genetics they had different body compositions to me and I know that now but back then I saw that they had the athletic body whereas I was just you know slim and a bit curvaceous so I was not the ideal they were instead Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I completely resonate with that as well, because I was the same. I went through puberty very early in comparison to my friends. I was the bigger one and I developed a lot quicker and I was a lot bigger and all my friends could eat whatever they wanted. And then they'll so stick thin. And then again, it's that story that we create that we're not good enough. Yeah, exactly. And it's so wild that we jump to these conclusions, especially like when we're young and vulnerable, it's not accepting our weaknesses. It's jumping to, I'm not good enough in terms of like, oh, I'm just, I don't like playing netball. I'm not good at that. That doesn't make you a bad person. That just means that you're not good at that. In comparison to like, if you are opened up, you know, like a creative side and like pulled out your book and you could probably read, you know, a book in like two days, whereas <laughs> those people probably couldn't even read a book in a month, but then it's not jumping to that conclusion that they're not good enough, you know? Yeah. I think also, you know, growing up in Australia, we're very, um, you know, sports driven as a culture. Yeah. Something I've never really resonated with about being Australian is <laughs> I was like, I really don't care about sport. Like I like watching the swimming because it's over and done with so quickly and diving and things like that. All my friends were so invested in sport and like they'd have their teams and they'd be playing themselves on the weekends and I just never like understood it. Yeah. And so I took that on board as well as there's something wrong with me instead of I'm just not that interested. Yeah. And and I know a lot of women are still doing that. It's because there's this idealistic thing that we should all be good at X, Y, and Z. And if we're not, then we're not enough. We're not worthy. We're, we suck. (laughs) And it's completely not the case. And that's why I love this personal development journey is because it's learning to come to a place of self-acceptance. And there's definitely a difference between self-acceptance and self-love. Like the vibe is not like, I love myself. I love this. I love that. But it's more about accepting the fact that, you know, we have got strengths and we have got weaknesses and that is a good thing. And that doesn't make, make us less worthy or whatever. So as a kid, like how are we meant to like rationalize and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> even as an adult sometimes, right? Like I only recently was able to do that, but that's just from all the personal development work that I've been able to do. And I've seen it, the switch in you as well, which is absolutely amazing. So I would love for you to explain what have you done in the past from, you know, that year, year eight, comparing yourself, what then did you fall into? What did you try? What did you do in order to achieve this aesthetic that we all want when we're at this young age? I think it would be easier to give you a list of all the things that I haven't done because <laughs> I've tried almost every fad, everything. So mm-hmm. if my friend said, you know, I did this 12 week boot camp thing, um, she would either, you know, in the days where they used to send out PDFs before they all had apps, Mm. Um, you know, we'd share the PDF with each other and we both like kill ourselves for 12 weeks and then miss athletic because my best friend, God love her, she is athletic. So Mm. she'd be swimming on the side, doing netball on the side and this 12 week thing. So she'd come out looking ripped (laughs) and (laughs) I'd be like dying in my bedroom with my little dumbbells, you know, (laughs) wondering what was wrong with me. Yeah. Um, so I've done like the bikini body, um, Kayla Itzini's thing, mm-hmm. which is now her sweat app. I tried Mari Fitness. She's based in the US. Um, I've tried the Hit Burn app. I got on to Kim French Fitness through Instagram. The one that I really liked was Kim French Fitness mm-hmm. because her whole thing was like, let's get strong, not skinny. And I, by the time I kind of found her, I realized that I'm never going to be skinny. Um, my sister is the slimmest in the family because of all of her activity and she still has a big bum. So I'm never going to be skinny, but I can be strong, which is why I liked Kim French. But most of the programs, you know, you do them for a couple of weeks and then you see some results and then you start going, oh, okay, well, I don't have to, you know, kill myself so much. So you take your foot off the gas a little bit. Or the other side of the spectrum is like week one, day one workout kills you so much that, you know, I couldn't walk for a couple of days. And I was you know, doing everything in secret in my bedroom. I wouldn't like exercise in front of anyone. Like that was so embarrassing. So I was just basically like killing my body, going to war against my body in the secrecy of my bedroom. 
I've tried, you know, blogilates on YouTube. I attended bar classes very, very religiously, and I absolutely loved them. I've done aerial yoga and non-aerial yoga. I've done, you know, lifting at the gym, all of the HIIT workouts. I tried swimming. I tried doing my 10,000 steps a day and that didn't last very long because it takes a very long time to get that many steps. You know, I've tried running and I've tried cycling and I picked those up and put them down at many points, but I never really tried any diets. I never went keto. I never went carb free. I never really did any diet sort of things, except for obviously the, I'm just not going to eat anything except for my dinner approach that I tried because, you know, I try and eat really healthy. And I think we all understand that when people think healthy food, they think salad. So I'd have a salad for lunch when I'd be, you know, doing an eight hour shift and there'd just be like, you know, some vegetables in there, no protein, no carbs. And then I'd be like, I'm so hungry. (laughs) So that wouldn't last for very long. I never really did the diet side. I did a lot of the exercise side. Mm-hmm. Wow, thank you for sharing that. And we just to sit here and normalize that. I know for a fact that there are so many women who have tried so many things, myself included. So we get to sit here and we get to normalize the fact that we're not crazy. We are actually like, we are driven humans who are like, we really want to just to achieve a goal so badly that we are willing to like, you know, put so much effort in. But then we just like, it is so frustrating that we're not like seeing the results that we want. And then it's like, why is it so hard? I just don't understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk me through success. Where did you find success? Talk me through that. Um, I think the short answer really and the reason I ended up coming to you was that they were not successful. I think the long answer though is, you know, I didn't achieve that, you know, body that I really wanted, but I did learn a lot by doing all of these different things. So, you know, I started going gym in my first year of uni straight after high school and I had never been to a gym before. I had no idea what was going on. So I just did what everyone does and they just stand on the treadmill and just like kind of look around like what's going on in this building. And then my boyfriend, who's obviously now my husband, he spoke to one of his friends who was a PT. And so he found me, suggested a really like kind personal trainer because this guy's style as PT was like, yell at you until you cry. And I said, David, if anyone yells at me, I will cry and I will not come back. And so his friend's like, okay, we'll go to this guy instead. You know, he's really kind. And he he really was. So, you know, he did um, free boxing sessions and really discounted PT with me when I was, you know, a poor uni student and couldn't really afford, afford to be there. And we trained together for like four or five years. Oh. And um, we did a lot of the functional fitness stuff. So he taught me a lot about, you know, form and active recovery and you know how to design a circuit that just hits you know a specific kind of area if you want to do cardio you want to do conditioning like what is it that you want to do and you know having a trainer meant that I was guaranteed to show up to the gym at least once a week Mm -hmm. to keep that appointment and then kind of while that was going on on the side I was you know following David around the gym like a little duckling (laughs) and watching what he was doing (laughs) and he would explain and then you know I so we'd swap on and off the machines together and so he taught me about you know reps and sets and pyramid sets and drop sets and tri sets and super sets and all of that stuff but then um, because I was working out for his goals essentially which was to bulk I started bulking too Mm -hmm. and um, (laughs) I was terrified because I'd wanted to be like super slim and super fit and super athletic and suddenly I was really wide and my shoulders couldn't fit in any of my shirts anymore and I was like what's happened like I became the Hulk and I didn't want to be so you know if I just stuck with it and trusted the process I understand what would have happened is I would have actually achieved my goals (laughs) I was just like I'm getting so wide so I stopped but you know we'd go bike riding on the weekends and he'd do like little boot camps in the park with me and you know I was going to bar for several years with my mum and sister and doing all of those things bar doesn't have progressive overload you know built in you're using the little 0.5 hand weights which by the end of the arm workout section is like basically all you can do because it's so tiring to be you know holding your arms out for you know 10 minutes but it helped me maintain at the weight I was at but not help me you know progress forward when I started teaching full-time you know I was drinking so much coffee and I was no longer working in retail so I wasn't moving around as much so I started stacking on weight again and then my clothes weren't fitting even though I was going to the gym and I was doing all of those things that I'd always been doing and so my friend at bar at the time just said hey I'm gonna try this you know 12 week Salto fit rebounding challenge you know I tried it a few years ago I really enjoyed it so I went with her and it was so fun so it was five nights a week for 12 weeks and you just came on the ones that you 
could. I think I got pneumonia halfway through, so I missed two weeks. But even with that, I changed my body composition so much. And obviously, like, that was going to happen. And they used to say, your body will change. Like, it has to change. You're doing intense workout, you know, this many nights a week. Your body is going to change. And it really did. So I had my ab definition. I could actually start lifting heavier at the gym. And, you know, my work colleague was like, you look so tight. And I was like, I do. Thank you so much. And so I was so hungry all the time and I was just eating everything that I wanted, but I wasn't going wild because I could feel like, it was like when I ate the tuna and rice, I could feel a muscle growing. So I was like, yes, let's eat more tuna and rice. And it was, it was like, I was just having the best time. And I was surrounded by all of these people, um, these very inspiring women at this place and, you know, at the workplace I was at were healthy, but they were also, you know, in that sustainable lifestyle phase. So it was just empowering to be able to be part of that kind of community. Mm -hmm. And then when that 12 weeks is over, I was like, I have to maintain this. And I actually did. So I was, you know, at the gym, I was doing my own hit circuits. I was, you know, running up and down those stairs and I was doing the deadlifts on the BOSU ball and doing all of that like wild stuff. And, um, you know, my PT would sometimes bring his clients over while he was over there. He'd come over and like, you know how, I don't know, like gym boys, they're like, they're a bit odd, right? Mm -hmm. So like he'd come and he'd just like put his finger in my ear or something while I was planking, just something really creepy. Like, and I wouldn't know he was there. And I was like, Ugh. and then he's there with his little like client. And then he'd be like, can you do the speed ladder again? You know, watch how she does it. That's what it's supposed to look like. And I was like, moi, moi, <laughs> me. So that I was so chuffed. Like that was the period of my life where, you know, I was actually part of the athletic community, which was a community that I hadn't been able to be part of in my whole life because I never played sports and I had no idea what I was doing. So I finally knew what I was doing and people were looking at me like she knows what she's doing. And I was like, yes, yes, I do. Thank you. But then, you know, I went to Europe and then I started a new school, which wasn't near my gym anymore. And then, you know, we had COVID light lockdown, that first like kind of, you know, maybe if you don't want to go out, don't go out. Mm-hmm. The one where the government was really trying not to lock us down. And then I fractured my ankle and then we had a proper lockdown. And then that was kind of like the end of all of that. So it's like I tried all of these things. I finally got to where I wanted to be Mm -hmm. and then like I was done. Like I could not get back to that. So, you know, ultimately all of those things failed (laughs) except that like I learned so much. So I can go to a yoga class and I know what's going on. I can do almost anything in a gym without watching a video. Like you have to send me a pretty obscure exercise before I'm like, "Mm, I have no idea what that one is. My sister and my best friend surprised me with a pole dancing class for my hands night. And because of aerial yoga, I was like, hell yeah, I'll just throw my body through the air. I have absolute confidence. I will not fall. So, you know, doing all of those things, I learned a lot. By the end of it, I had no idea still about nutrition. And I was kind of right back where I had started in terms of the body that I had and the body that I wanted. Yeah. Oh, I love all of that so much that we can pull out and learn from. But that's also a testament to your own emotional intelligence, being able to sit there and say, oh, I'm not good enough because I failed all these times. It's you're in that growth mindset where you're able to say, I learned a lot. Like it just unlocks this potential of like endless growth, which is so freaking amazing. And then it's just like, what else can we learn and then achieve and then continue to grow? So that's absolutely phenomenal that you're able to switch that mindset. In terms of like breaking free from these, like, you know, the challenges and the like all in, all out, all that mentality of trying something and then not being able to stick to it long term, what really helped you break free of that and helped you find food freedom and almost like body freedom as well? Well, like because I had no real understanding of nutrition, I was kind of doing like the swing completely to one end of the pendulum and just be like, YOLO, I'll eat whatever I want. It'll be fine. And then I'd go completely the opposite way and I'd just be you know in that super restrictive phase just for a couple weeks because I had like this special event coming up like my wedding and I'd be like let's you know blitz this and then at the same time you know some other people in my life were doing the same thing so I was like well if we're all doing the same thing you know confirmation bias like you would say means that it must be fine but then when I started working with you and you just said like food is fuel 
And I was like, oh, okay, you know, that actually makes so much sense. You know, how can I expect that my body and my mind will be able to do all of the things in a day that I, I need it and I want it to do if I'm not fueling it properly? So on a given day as a casual teacher now, because I don't have my own classroom anymore and I'm not just wandering up and down the hallway from the staff room, I might get like 8,000 steps a day. You know, last Friday, I got 14,000 steps because I was just up and down all over everywhere. And then, you know, I drive home which is a long drive or a commute which is also you know draining to do if you've ever had to commute after a long day and then I'm expecting myself to then back up and go to the gym or you know go for a run or you know spend time with my husband without falling asleep on the couch you know walk my dogs so I'm doing a lot Mm -hmm. and I need to be fueling myself correctly otherwise there's absolutely no way I can do all of those things so like my best example is actually again maybe the universe just knew I needed examples for this um so on Saturday I went for my run with my sister and my brother in the morning which was a hungover run because I had Christmas drinks with my colleagues the night before and I just had like this insatiable craving for chocolate milk chocolate milkshakes specifically made with chocolate ice cream not the syrup ones Mm -hmm. so after our run we usually get like you know an iced coffee and we you know chat and you know catch up as siblings and then I go home have breakfast with my husband and we go about our day so I had instead of my coffee I had a chocolate milkshake because I absolutely needed one ASAP and then I got home and then I was like David I need another chocolate milkshake like if I do not get one it's not going to be funny and so during that day I had like five or six chocolate milkshakes because I just needed chocolate milkshake and I needed it now and then on Sunday morning when my husband's like I'm going to the gym do you want to come I was like oh no fine I will so I like ro- like rolled out of bed quickly chubbed my clothes on go to the gym so I didn't even have a coffee and then I struggled the whole time I was at the gym like my squats were a struggle my hip thrusts were a struggle even just like looking at the list of things that I still had to do and being like <laughs> it was just like the worst and um you know, my husband's over there working out and I was like, can you come and film my squats, please? Blah, blah, blah. And then he's like, are you okay? I was like, I just don't want to do this. Like, it's so hard. And he goes, you literally just woke up. Like, what did you expect? You know, you had the milkshakes yesterday. You didn't eat anything that even closely resembles protein, except for all of that ice cream. You haven't had a coffee. You haven't eaten today. You forgot your water bottle at the gym. Like, what were you expecting? And I was like, oh yeah, you know, actually, Go me. I still squatted that 45 kilos, even though I did, you know, not feel my body correctly. So the fact that I, you know, showed up and still basically did everything I was supposed to do was a freaking miracle (laughs) and was so amazing. Yes. Um, And let's just like pull attention to that because it's like, that is the difference between someone who is successful in their goals versus someone who is, gets caught up in that perfectionism mindset and there's, oh no, it's not good enough. What's the point? So that again is just like celebrating your growth in on that and being able to switch that mindset in terms of like, you still showed up for yourself. Like it's not giving up and we need to freaking normalize that. Like having those cravings for certain things is like normal. And we shame ourselves so much for it. And we were like, we're so bad. I feel so guilty about it. But that's the thing. Like it is normal. And we have to share that as women because like I absolutely sometimes I have this same craving for chocolate and like I definitely can't stop. I can't just have my like six pieces that I eat every night. Right. So it's but then it's that different mindset that we're able and need to develop to create those sustainable change is the fact that it's not bad. We don't need to feel shame. We don't need to feel guilt. We just need to jump back on the bandwagon. So I love that story and I love you sharing that. And it's absolutely so much yes in that. So talk me through what else has really helped you. Yeah. So I think really linking with that is kind of that, like giving yourself grace, like what you just said, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to keep going. And I'm trying to kind of bring that vibe into my life a lot more, not just in this area, but in the other areas. Like I was really down on myself about the fact that my house is always a mess. And then I was like, oh, well, you know, like my house is always going to be a mess. You've got two adults working full time until recently and you've got two dogs who are shedding fur everywhere. Like, of course, the house is a mess. Like, just, you know, let it go. Like, you may actually remember that when we were kind of talking about our beliefs about ourselves in that fit and free workshop, I kind of said that I think that I'm very lazy as a person. And, you know, I see everyone around me and it is the culture that we have now. Like, you got to hustle. Everyone's got like a side job. You know, people are staying up to like 2 a.m. And even if you don't have a side job, you're so committed to your 
your one job that you're just like going above and beyond. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of like, you know, I'm a very proud unionist. And I was like, you know what, I get paid for 35 hours a week. And, you know, I'm going to work 35 hours a week. And that never lasted because teaching is not a job that is 35 hours a week. But I would often just be like, is that my job? And one of my colleagues was, you know, really encouraging in that, you know, stop going above and beyond, stop it. And Mm -hmm. so then I was kind of like, oh, I see everyone hustling. And then I'm like, I must be in bed and have my nine hours of sleep or I'm, you know, a gremlin. I cannot function. (laughs) And everybody else is like, oh, I, you know, I only got two hours of sleep. And I'm like, how are you alive? You know? So I've just felt like I was such a lazy person. And, you know, I quit teaching because actually to do it properly, you do need to commit a lot of time and you do have to work on the weekends. And you know what? I'm unwilling to do that. So I'm lazy and that's why I quit. But through that workshop, when we were kind of talking that out, I realized I'm not lazy. Mm -hmm. I actually don't like failing, which Mm -hmm. is, you know, something that all of us don't like to do. Like we don't want to be embarrassed and we don't want to fail. So I was trying not to do that, trying not to fail. So then I just wouldn't try. And then I'd be like, you're so lazy. You didn't even try. And (laughs) I was was like, there was no win for me there. (laughs) So, you know, the whole time it was just, you know, my ego who I've called Barbara, as you know, protecting Mm -hmm. me. I'm creating this narrative of laziness. And, you know, it's cost me, you know, wonderful experiences with my friends and with my family, you know, and it stopped me from experiencing so many things that I would really have loved to try. You know, I haven't applied for all these jobs because I'm like, I will get rejected. So I'm not even going to bother. And then I even considered going back to teaching, even though I just quit, because at least I know that, you know, I can be good at that and I won't Mm -hmm. fail at that just to protect myself. But, you know, under your direction, I've been really reflecting on, you know, you're not lazy, actually. You're working towards your goals and you need to just give yourself grace and just be really kind to yourself instead of just saying, no, you're not, you need to be perfect or you might as well not bother because it's like, you know, I can't have six chocolate milkshakes. And then I can go to the gym on Sunday and I can try my best. And then, you know, Monday's coming and I can do my best on Monday. And just one day after the other, after the other, you just keep doing the best you can on that one day. And then, you know, you just keep moving. And sometimes my calories are over because I was like, I need tiny teddies. I need tiny teddies or I will cry. So I'm just like, you know what? It's fine. I'm going to have the tiny teddies and then I'm going to pull myself together and I'm going to go to the gym. And that's fine. And that's been, you know, I'm still learning how to do that, but that's kind of something that's really important is just be really kind to yourself. Absolutely. And that's like one of my biggest things is like acknowledge yourself. And that comes back to that place of self-acceptance. It really does. And it really comes back to our own worth and thinking that we are good enough and X, Y, and Z. And then it's also coming to the place of ego. Like when we're living our life driven by our ego, it's not what we truly want. So of course we're going to feel upset. Of course we're going to feel shit. Of course we're going to feel low vibe. It's because we're doing things for external validation. We're making decisions based off like getting our ego stroke to make us feel good and prevent the judgment and the rejection. But then of course we feel absolutely terrible because it's not what we truly want. So just for you to be able to shift that and start, and that's like that big piece of the celebration of quitting your job in the first place and actually, you know, basing things off your values and your true self is absolutely inspiring. For you, I think being so true to you and being able to set boundaries in and around work is absolutely phenomenal, right? Because there are so many people that are like, you know, they get paid for those 35 hours and then they work like, you know, crazy, crazy stuff. But then like, how long can you pour from a non-empty cup, right? Yeah. And it's ridiculous. And it's like you being strong enough to set your boundaries is a testament to your self-worth because only someone with a strong self-worth can actually do that, right? Mm. I feel like as a teacher as well, a lot of people are like, oh, you get school holidays. Like, what's the problem? And I was like, okay, so, you know, I get paid for 35 hours a week and I work maybe 55 and times that extra 20 hours by 10 weeks, I'm owed 200 hours in overtime (laughs) that I'm never going to get paid. Mm -hmm. That school holiday is not even a tip of that iceberg. And I spend like the first week asleep, just, you know, recovering. Mm -hmm. And then one, the second week planning for the next term. Like it is that culture that, you know, we've cultivated in industry. Australia, we work some of the longest hours in the developed world. And it's like, why? Why are we doing this? Like, why are we so invested in our jobs when, you know, life is happening, life is happening around us and we're just missing it out, like missing out on it Mm -hmm. because we are just bogged down in, you know, our jobs. 
Mm, absolutely and then it like flows into the rest of our lives Mm. right because then like we want a certain body but then like we're destroying ourselves in another aspect but then we're blaming and trying to make up for it in like in our exercise and nutrition but that's not the problem our exercise and nutrition is not necessarily the problem it's like it's our mental health it's how we perceive ourselves it's like what we're doing are we acting from ego or are we acting from our true self and if we're constantly being driven in the ego space, of course we're burnt out. Of course we feel like shit. Of course we lose motivation. Of course we don't want to meal plan. Of course we don't want to show up at the gym. Of course we don't want to do our steps, right? So that's why it's so important to look at health and fitness in such a holistic way in terms of like, are you happy? Are yeah. you actually genuinely happy? Because that is going to impact all your decisions you make. And the other thing is like, are you making your decisions based off fear or are you be- making your decisions based off like what you truly, really desire? Another yeah, thing, I think- thing I really wanted to ask you in terms of like, how are you able to start letting things go? Because I know that's a big thing that a lot of people do struggle with is because they know they have to let it go, but they're just not sure how. So how did you personally start doing that? Yeah, I was actually thinking about this morning because, you know, I had an interaction with a student yesterday um, (laughs) and I was seething hours after. I was like, why are you still so like caught up on the fact that this girl was a bit passive aggressive to you? Like, Mm. like why? I really do actually struggle. I was thinking about that this morning. You know, I hold grudges against people for the the smallest of things and I've really struggled over like the long term to kind of put together why. And it is because it is that what do they think of me? if I've backed down in this situation or if I let them, you know, win this imaginary argument, then Mm. what I'm saying is that they're right and I'm wrong. And Mm. that's, you know, the ego coming out again to be like, well, you know, you have to hold this grudge or you can't let this go because you are actually very much right. You know, that car tailgating you was very much wrong. So I'm just like, why why do I care what this random person on the M4 like was doing at 3.30 in the afternoon? Like, we were all just trying to get home. I got home. They hopefully got home too. And like, why am I so caught up on this like very minor interaction? So some of the things that I've tried is journaling, like, I'm not very good at journaling and by good I mean I'm very inconsistent as you know because you put it on my weekly planner it's there on my Sundays Mm -hmm. and then sometimes I'll do it on a Monday and then after that I come like I just think about it for the rest of the week so a lot of my journaling is actually now just happening in my brain um, Mm -hmm. as I'm driving along and I'm just kind of like why am I so so stressed about this and so I'll just go round and round in my head about it and ask the questions like why are you making this about you know your self-worth why are you making this about you? Why can't it just be a small interaction or a small thing that you just let go? Or what if we just didn't care about this? Is that an option? So we're kind of doing that as we go along. So I won't say that I'm very good at letting things go because I do definitely hold on to things. But, you know, it is just kind of also wondering, I've got this much energy. How much energy am I going to spend on, you know, this one thing versus all the other things in my life that I could be, you know, allocating that attention and that energy to instead? I just want to pull the piece back out of that in terms of like you saying that you're not good at letting things go because I'm calling you out on your bullshit there because if you weren't good at letting things go, you would have been sitting driving in your car, dwelling on the fact and feeling guilt or feeling shame or feeling shit. But instead you're able to change that conversation into the questions of why am I making this mean? Like, what am I making this mean about myself? Why am I making this mean anything about me? Why am I pulling it back to my worth? So just having being able to rationalize and have that conversation in your head is absolutely evidence of you being able to let things go. And that is absolutely evidence why you need a coach. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. But that's absolutely right. And being able to build that and continue to practice that, it's not something that happens overnight, right? It's definitely something that takes time and consistency and taking responsibility to actually make change. So this beautifully leads me into my next question of how you were able to take radical responsibility in creating habits that were really able to support your goals and change that mindset from like that all in, all out dieter mentality mindset into this beautiful space where you're sitting in this like non-restrictive consistency lifestyle sort of vibe. 
I think the first thing has been, and something that we worked on a lot in the Fit and Free Academy was understanding our values and what it is that we want out of our lives and what we really, really genuinely want to do and be. Uh, so if I'm, you know, umming and ahhing, like, what do I do here? I just kind of bring it back and I'm like, well, how does this, you know, align with my values? Does it even align with my values? So, you know, on a Friday afternoon, you will find me at the local leagues club with a glass of wine and a bowl of chippies with my colleagues. And that's fine because I really value the time that we spend and all of us have very busy lives. You know, some people have kids and we all have pets and we've all got things that we could be doing, but we all consciously put aside our Friday afternoon, even though we don't all work together anymore to sit down and catch up and, you know, maintain our friendship. And that's something I really value. And so that's actually fine. I'm absolutely fine that on Fridays, my macros are going to be a bit thrown out because I will have the chips and I'll have the wine. And Mm -hmm. that, that is what it is because I really value that. But at the same time, ordering a pizza just because like I can't be bothered to cook dinner does not align with my values at all. And so that's just not on. So I don't do that anymore. You know, I've had to eat some humble pie a couple of times in the last few weeks. So, um, you know, I apologize to you because my food tracking was always half finished and that made your job as a coach really difficult. And how can you help me if I'm not helping you? And I apologized slash confessed to my husband because I didn't want to go to the gym. So I just said, I have a really bad headache. And he felt so bad for me. He got me like the Panadol and he got me the water. And on his way home, he bought me the orange juice because he knows that's what I need. And I just felt, I know he like, bless him. But I was just like, yeah, you know, I feel really guilty um, for lying to you. And, you know, I should have just said that I didn't want to go. There was no reason that I couldn't go. Um, So I'm really sorry. You know, I lied to you and I also let myself down. And like, I don't really know what I was expecting him to say once I, you know, groveled a little bit. And he just like raised his eyebrows at me and was like, do you want to go get changed? Like I can do another session. Like we can go. And I was like, oh. Okay. So like I went and got dressed and off we went. He like, you know, I don't know, I think he walked on the treadmill and then went sat in the sauna for a while while I, you know, did the workout that I could have done before. Um, So, you know, it's just like we as women are really harsh on ourselves. I think like Mm-hmm. way more harsh than the people that we love would ever be mm-hmm. and then you go and you apologize to someone thinking that you're like the worst person that ever existed and they're always just like oh yeah that's okay you know we understand we move on mm-hmm. and part of moving on for me has been automating processes so that I can't you know let people down because I just forgot about them or you know couldn't be bothered to do something so you know like I have the reminders and the alarms to track my meals I've got the routines and systems so that I'm you know accountable to myself but also so that I don't have to think because once I start thinking you know Barbara gets going slash my own desire to sit on the couch gets going and I'm just like I don't really want to do anything so I just you know from week eight on as a teacher is the worst because you know you're tired and cranky the kids are tired and cranky your Mm -hmm. colleagues are tired and cranky and you know you spend a whole day and you're being ignored you're getting yelled at you're rushing around like a headless chook you know you're making peace between colleagues and you're making peace between kids who are bickering and you're just making a thousand billion decisions and then you get home and then you're making more decisions like do I go to the gym and then what do I wear at the gym I'm doing leg days what shoes do I wear what's for dinner have I had enough protein today how am I going to get that extra protein in it's just like so many choices and then you just go into overload and shut down so automating everything like Mm. batch cooking opting for those easy foods even if they're not the most nutritious like you know I know that my muesli bar has a lot of sugar in it but it also has 10.5 10.5 grams of protein so yeah. I'm like that's easier than something that's maybe more nutritious so I just do that make my morning smooth then make my afternoon smooth and then you know some days you know I'll swap my tiny teddies so that I can have an extra coffee because I just need the extra coffee to get through the day and that you know links beautifully back to just you know letting go a little bit not prioritizing perfection and just you know like keep going keep chugging along and you'll eventually get there Mm-hmm. And then I think the last thing is like really understanding what your problems are and like where you are liable to fall down. Yes. So I as discovered <laughs> um, when I started tracking, if I just have one glass of wine or one alcoholic beverage of any type, I will order a pizza or I will order a burger. I will order something instead of the pre-cooked food that would actually be faster for me to eat, by the way. I'm like, no, I really feel like the greasiest of burgers. And then I eat it and I'm like, oh, I feel really like quite sick. So now I do eat, 
or organize the food, have it heating before you pour the wine, before you pour the gin. And that's not only saving me a ridiculous amount of money, but just make sure that I'm not derailing myself. I can still have the wine, that's fine, but I'm just going to have it after I eat because otherwise, you know, I just go a little bit wild. (laughs) And I'm not the type to give up alcohol. Like I have tried and it's just not for me. So I just give myself permission to drink in those circumstances. So, you know, with my friends on a Friday afternoon at date night with my husband, we can have a drink. That's fine. But I'm not going to be binge drinking just on a normal Monday night. That's stupid. So I'm relying on my self-control because I'm not giving things up and I'm not, you know, saying absolutely not. I'm a dopamine seeker. I'm going to go and do the things that are fun. (laughs) So I'm not going to try and stop that because that's not going to work. So I just set some boundaries, which, you know, are important in all our relationships, including my relationship with myself is having some boundaries so that, you know, I'm not setting myself up to fail. And I have a weekly to-do list, not a daily to-do list. Because if I don't get my leg day in on a Monday and it was scheduled on a Monday, then I'm not going to do it on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday because that's not leg day. So now I just have a weekly one and it just all has to get done by Sunday. So, you know, that's why this week I rolled out of bed post milkshakes and I, you know, hit legs because I had to get it done. It was Sunday. So I had to, like my time was out. So those sorts of things, like, you know, I get home from work, I don't sit down. I just go and get changed straight away, go to the gym. Once I sit down, I'm done. Those like understanding my habits and, you know, my Achilles heels and then just finding a workaround instead of being like, well, I'm just going to make sure that I rely on my self-control because I have none and most of us have none. So don't try and rely on it. Wow. 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 This is so valuable. And the biggest piece here is knowing yourself. And that's why like the personal development industry like, kind of like piece me a little bit because the, it's always like the best way to do this, the best morning routine, the best habit, the best, you know, the best diet even. Yeah, it's about changing something about you. Yeah. And it's exactly. And then if you're not like responding to your own weaknesses and your own Achilles heels, then you're not going to be able to copy and paste someone else's template and put it into your life because you're not that person. And that's not going to be beneficial for you because then you're relying on that control piece of like, oh, I have to do it, blah, blah, blah. Instead of actually changing your own behavior and your own habits and focusing in on the areas that you actually need to focus on. And that's why like personalized advice is so important because of that that reason. So that is so amazing that you're able to do that. And that's such a big takeaway for anyone who's listening to that is understand yourself, know where you struggle, know what you struggle with. So then you can implement the things that can actually get you to your end goal instead of like shaming yourself and feeling guilty. The fact that you can't follow up someone else's workout or you can't follow someone else's thing, right? Like I'm never going to journal in the morning. Like it's just not something that I'm going to do because I'm not a morning person. My brain's not even functional. So, you know, now that I'm casual teaching, if I'm off in that period, I'll do it, you know, period one. Sometimes I'll do it at lunchtime or sometimes I'll do it in the evening, but Mm -hmm. I'm never going to do it in the morning. I'm never going to go to the gym, you know, before work. That's just never going to be for me. And Mm -hmm. every single time I've been like, I'm going to get up and run before work. Mm -hmm. I've failed. And then I feel so bad about it. I'm just like, mornings aren't for me. It's just not going to happen. And that is such a empowered, like an empowered place to be in. And that's where everyone needs to find their own space for. Like it just is, life becomes so much easier. Like, you know, adapt it to your own being. But the first thing that you really need to understand is like yourself. And that in itself, number one is terrifying because you have to be able to develop self-honesty and being completely honest with yourself is so hard, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I love all of that so much. Thank you so much for sharing that. Brings me into the next question of what's your biggest advice for anyone who is struggling with their relationship with food or their body? I really think getting a coach has been the game changer for me. Like I'm not an idiot. And I'm not stupid. (laughs) I'm so hyper rational and I'm so logical and I see everything, almost everything in black and white. You know, I have all of this knowledge. I knew about macros and I knew that I needed to have progressive overload. I knew all of that, but I just, my inner monologue wasn't rational and it wasn't logical. And most of the time it wasn't based on reality. So I had the brain telling me, you know, have three days a week is more than enough. Don't try and exercise five days a week. That's too wild. But then the emotional brain was like, hang on a minute. 
you're not going to get those results unless you kill yourself trying. And so even though I logically understood what was going on in my brain, it was really hard to just move past. So having, you know, you as a coach was just so game changing for me because first things first, I keep appointments with other people and I don't necessarily show up for myself. So having you, you know, checking in that I was going to the gym three times a week, made sure that I was going to the gym three times a week because I was not going to cancel those appointments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was showing up for the sessions because I'd already paid for them and I already needed to be there and you'd given us homework to do. And so I was going to be there because that was an appointment. So it was not negotiable. So that was really helpful, especially, you know, building some habits and building some consistency. And then, you know, I was working full time and I was newly married and I was trying to do all of these things. And so I was kind of offloading a lot of the mental stuff to you. So you figured out my calorie needs. You figured out my macros. You told me, okay, we're going into, you know, a deficit now. And now we're going back into maintenance. And I was like, no worries, Laura. I will just do what you have told me to do. And (laughs) and thank you so, so much for your time. And then, you know, as I was doing it, I kind of realized what was going on. And I figured out which foods and which combinations would get me to the protein target. And, you know, which foods were kind of going to, add a ridiculous amount of calories without really helping me hit my protein target. So I was learning, but I didn't have to do a lot of the thinking instead of having to try and figure out my own, you know, nutrition, my own exercises, and then program in my progressive overload by myself. <laughs> and then, and the then mindset- comes the doubt of like, <laughs> is this right? Am I doing this right? Am, Am I-, I doing it right? Yeah. Do you remember yeah. when I made that really, really excessive spreadsheet with all of the macros in it? And you're like, that's kind of more than what I needed you to do. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I remember that. I was like, oh my God, your brain. It's amazing. Um, (laughs) So then the mindset stuff that we worked on, you know, it was so brilliant because, you know, rationally and logically, I know I'm I'm not fat Mm -hmm. and being fat isn't bad anyway. And, you know, even if I was as big as my house, I'm still, you know, a really valuable person living a beautiful life and, you know, positively impacting the world around me. So my brain in that sense was not acting, you know, a rational or logical manner. And, you know, I know that I'm not actually a lazy person and I'm not a bad person, but, you know, I was making all of this stuff about my worth. And, you know, that's because for us as women, you know, none of this body image stuff is rational and none of it is logical. And then you'd repeat my statements back to me like you did before. I'm just going to call you on your bullshit. And you'd be like, (laughs) let's look at the evidence. You know, you went to the gym three times this week. Please tell me how you're lazy. It's like, Mm -hmm. oh. Oh, sorry, Laura, I can't can't really tell you that I'm lazy, can I? And be like, you know, I'm going to call you on your bullshit. I have seen your progress photos. And I was like, oh, okay, um, thank you. So, like, I built these schemas in my brain mm-hmm. where I was this person and then you just threw some problematic knowledge and I'm, like, hastily rearranging my schemas to kind of accommodate that. And, you know, they were used to this narrative that I was not built to have an athletic body or to be happy or body confident or any of those things. And you just disrupted that because you were that objective outsider. And I could trust that you weren't just placating me like my husband would or my mom would. And so that was, you know, having a coach was that first step towards really kind of healing my brain and its relationship to my body. Yeah. And that really helped me kind of realign my life. And so it's not just been about fitness, Mm -hmm. you know, that spilled over into my, you know, courage to be able to walk away from my job. And it spilled over into my, you know, courage to kind of throw my hands in the air some weeks and say, our house is a bomb site, but I need to sleep. (laughs) (laughs) Or, you know, my dogs need walking more than my kitchen needs cleaning. So just kind of it spills over into all of those other aspects once you are living in that alignment. And you just need someone who can call you on your bullshit and who can help you just kind of see that, you know, navigate that journey. Because it's really hard and it's confronting to kind of think about, you know, like I'm my own worst enemy sometimes. And that's not a pleasant thought to have. And so you really just need someone who can, you know, really coach you kindly, gently through. (laughs) But, you know, like I know that coaches aren't cheap and they shouldn't be. 
because of the, you know, the skills and experience that you brought. Um, if you had charged any less, you would have been, you know, vastly undervaluing your skills. <laughs> so I think for someone who really can't afford that right now, it's, you know, just track everything. So if you're looking for body composition change, you know, figure out your calories and eat them all, figure out your macros, hit your protein target, make sure you're just doing that. Take your progress photos. When you go to the gym, what are you doing? And track your progress on that. If you're doing a new program, you know, give it a couple months before you write it off because if you lose 20 kilos in a month, you know, that's not sustainable. So just gather the data. And then if you're making your journey more about your mindfulness stuff, you know, track how often you're journaling and any themes that are coming up regularly for you in that period. You know, are you meditating every day and like start tracking how often you're doing it and how you feel before and after, you know, spend time with yourself. And in both of those, you're just gathering data and gathering evidence so that you can make decisions that are actually based on evidence and not based on like your thoughts and feelings about your health and your wellness. Yes, I absolutely love that. Making decisions based off evidence, not off a, an emotional charge, I like to call it, or emotional <laughs> reaction and learning how to react rather than respond is such a powerful thing that we can do in this space because you're absolutely right in terms of like body image and how we perceive ourselves and everything like that it absolutely is not logical Mm. it's not we know that we're not fat we're not this we're not that but then as soon as we get triggered we look at ourselves in the mirror in a certain way and all of a sudden you're not good enough because you're not skinny enough or you're not thin enough you're not Mm. strong enough or whatever that may be So I love the fact that you, like the coaching experience for you wasn't just like the exercise and nutrition. And I bang on about this all the time in terms of like, it's our emotional beliefs that we really need to shift in order to be able to actually get that full transformation. Like if we're not changing the story, if we're not changing the way we speak to ourselves, then how are we ever going to be fully happy? Because self-worth, it comes from a place of self-worth and that comes from within. Confidence is internal. External helps, absolutely, but it's all starting from the first thing that we say to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I love your transformation because it's so much more than learning about nutrition and it's more than learning about exercise. And you even said that the flow on effect that it has into all areas of your life and it's absolutely amazing. It's because it's like how we do one thing is how we do everything. And if we're showing up in our nutrition and our exercise in a certain way, like that's how we're going to be showing up in our job. That's going to be how we're showing up in our loving relationships, in our friendships. So it's like it's just this whole mindset thing and working on it is just like such a brings so much pleasure and joy to so many more elements as well as the body aesthetics that come with it so Mm. it's such a win-win and you should be honestly so proud of yourself for like leaning into fear and you know having these hard conversations because sitting there with me asking you these hard questions is not easy like no yeah it's (laughs) confronting and it's terrifying (laughs) and it's hard Sometimes me as a coach, I'm like, oh, am I too harsh? Am I too direct? But it's like, it's always coming from that loving place of like, everyone just needs to see that like what we tell ourselves isn't necessarily always true. So I really appreciate you coming on and telling your story and sharing your experience and normalizing the fact that like what you went through, it's so hard. And But the thing is like so many of us go through it, myself included, and a lot of the other girls in the coaching program. So just you being able to speak about your story is really, really helpful. So thank you. Well, thank you for having me for my podcast <laughs> debut. <laughs> I love that. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add or add um, on to this? Yeah, I think so. The one thing, you know, just while you've been talking, I kind of was just like it pinged into my brain that, Mm. you know, in the spectrum of life, you know, like we make so many choices. Mm -hmm. And my friend once said to me, like, you don't make good choices and you don't make bad choices. You just make choices and you make one and then you make another and then you make another and then you just keep making them. And then eventually you kind of get to where you were supposed to be. And so I feel like, you know, I've kind of taken that and then I also, you know, sometimes think, do am I going to regret this? So if I, you know, made the choice next year because I've had, you know, offers to go back to teaching full time, I would regret that because mm-hmm. I'd end up, you know, in 10 years. Well, firstly, next year I'd be back where I started. Mm-hmm. But then in 10 years, I wouldn't have made progress to where I wanted to go. And, you know, when I'm thinking, when I get home, you know, I'm really tired, you know, I don't really want to go to the gym today. And then I think to myself, will I regret not going to the gym or will I feel better after? And so Mm. some days, you know, I've had enough. I cannot go because if I go, the second I struggle with something, you know, I will burst into tears. And that is when you've hit your limit. 
And that was all the time for me when I was like burnt out. And so making the choice on that day to prioritize something else is not a bad decision. It's just a choice that you have made. And then given the same set of circumstances, a few weeks later, you might still choose, I'm just going to go to the gym today because maybe I will, or I'm going to go and get a coffee and I'm going to sit in the sunshine or go for a walk with my husband. I'm going to do any on any day, I will make a completely different choice and none of them are bad and none of them are good. They're just choices. And so that takes a lot of the pressure off making choices. And you Mm. just think back to your values. Does this align with what I want to be like, what I want my life to look like? And then I bring in the, will I regret it if I do or don't? And that's just kind of how I've started structuring my life. That is so beautiful. And I love that. And that place of knowing yourself in terms of protecting your energy and your energy is the thing that you need to protect because that's your vibe, right? That's, Mm. that's your motivation levels. It's like you showing up for yourself. It's you doing everything. And that's the difference between learning between really like lazy energy or self-care energy in terms of like, am I actually reaching my limits? Do I need to slow down or am I being lazy and do I need to push myself out the door? And it's about then being able to make that choice and then not being judgmental Mm. on that choice. It's being non-judgmental. You're coming to yourself with compassion rather than judgment. So I love that. What a way to finish the episode. (laughs) So thank you again so much for being here today. That is it for this episode and I will see you all next week.